My name is Sayantani Dasgupta. I'm a medical humanities educator and a writer. And the idea that I want to share with you today is a philosophy of listening that I've been calling narrative humility. But before I get started, let me ask you all a question. When was the last time you felt truly listened to? Not just heard while somebody was texting, but deeply attended to. And I want you to grab a hold of that memory and kind of hold it within yourself for a moment. Because that sort of relational moment, that sort of being seen and being heard and being made to understand that we matter in this world, that is one of our fundamental human needs. And so let me ask you a follow-up question. It is this. When you were being listened to, how did you know? What were the behaviors of listening, the eye contact or the touching, that let you know that your listener was right there with you and not thinking about his groceries or something? And I think that if I were to take a survey of everyone here, I might get as different answers as there are people here. Because listening is not a one-size-fits-all activity. Right? Listening is not simply 10 seconds of touching or eye contact. It is nothing less than tapping into our innermost humanity and making that humanity present such that we might witness the humanity of another. And so if listening is not a one-size-fits-all activity, we get to the crux of my professional life, which is, OK, then, how do you teach it? Because that's my job. As a professor in the program in narrative medicine at Columbia University, and as a faculty member here in the health advocacy program at Sarah Lawrence College, I teach healthcare professionals how to listen to stories. Because if being listened to is one of our fundamental human needs, it is exponentially so in moments of illness, crisis, trauma, in fact, we often call stories the little boats that help us navigate the treacherous waters as we make our way from, as Susan Sontag would say, the kingdom of the well to the kingdom of the sick and hopefully back again. And those stories need listeners. They need witnesses. Of course, nothing I'm saying is particularly new. In ye olden days, before doctors had anything of interest in their black bags, right, no MRIs or fancy lab tests, what we had was the ability to show up. What we had was the ability to listen, to attend to somebody's birth, life, death, everything in between. But what's happened with the increasing technological skills necessary to modern medicine, right? Reading MRIs, interpreting lab tests, is that we've pushed that first relational, storied heart of medicine to the wayside. And so what my colleagues in medical humanities and I are suggesting is that we hold on equal stead those two ways of knowing, a scientific way of knowledge construction and a storied way. It is just as important to be able to read, interpret a radiograph, an x-ray, and read or interpret a patient's story. Easier said than done, however, in our modern age. Why? Because, as we all know, we are being inundated with information, simultaneous narratives that we have to process all the time, right? We are in the midst of a cultural crisis of story, a cultural crisis of listening, so much so that Brown University neuroscientist Seth Horowitz has been writing about the fact that we are losing our higher order listening functions. In, order, in other words, that ability to tune out what's unimportant and tune in to one person, one narrative, one story, in all of its twists and turns and unexpected happenings. In fact, there's this rich field of attention studies. This is a CAT scan of a lung with some nodules in it. And some researchers showed it to Harvard University radiologists, folks who are used to seeing stuff like this. And they were asked, what's wrong with this picture? Even when they were told, can you find the gorilla in this image? 80 
of Harvard University radiologists did not see it, and neither did I when I was reading about this study, that in fact, there is a you know, little gorilla man up there in the upper left-hand corner. And this is but one of a series of such gorilla in the picture studies. And it seems unbelievable, right? How can you not see the gorilla in the picture? But I think it speaks to this crisis of story. It speaks to this idea that we see what we expect to see. We hear the story we expect to hear. And this is actually really critical in medicine, that we open ourselves up to stories in such a way that we are open to seeing the gorilla in the picture. Why? Not just because it's nice or it might give us a more satisfying professional life, which it will, but because opening ourselves up to stories, listening to stories deeply, makes us do our job better in medicine. Not just that, but perhaps more cost effectively. Perhaps we might deliver a more just medicine. So if I'm open to stories, then I might know that this elderly woman that I'm seeing is an avid gardener. And I might realize that she's using a new pesticide this year. And that the syndrome of symptoms that I'm seeing are actually secondary to some kind of pesticide contamination and not some exotic disease that I'm about to spend thousands of dollars testing for. A real story. Um, I was once treating a little girl for an ear infection, a simple ear infection. It wasn't getting better. And so I called the mom into the office. I was sure she was doing something wrong. And I said, ma'am, can you show me how you're giving this medicine? She said, OK, doc. And she drew up you know, in a syringe the right amount of medicine, the five cc's or whatever it was of the amoxicillin. And she says, well, three times a day, doc, I dry it up, and I administer the medicine. She held up to her ear. <laughs> This is, of course, an oral antibiotic. And it was sheer arrogance on my part that I hadn't made that explicit. And you know, ear infection, you put the medicine in the ear. Like, it makes sense, right? Um, but I think that this wasn't so much me being open to gorillas as it was a gorilla like hitting me over the head. But certainly, it made me do my job better. OK, so you say, oh, opening ourselves up to stories is so important. Surely they're teaching that in medical school. Yeah, no, not so much. Um, when I went to Hopkins Medical School, a wonderful place to be from, when you first walk in, the first thing you see is this giant statue of Jesus on a pedestal kind of peering over you. And somehow you start getting the message that you too are expected to somehow be godlike in your medical practice, peering over people. You're told things like, you're the best of the best, and you're walking in the footsteps of giants. And as you're being kind of fed this culture of hierarchy in medicine, you're also systematically having your own humanity stripped from you. It was very clear to us that the work, patient care, came first before going to the bathroom, sleeping, eating, taking care of your own family. And while this may seem like a good idea, like, sure, I want a doctor who thinks about me before they think about going to the bathroom, right? We have to think at what cost, at what cost. And I think part of the cost is this culture of hierarchy. And part of the cost is this stripping of humanity from people who are, in fact, tasked with listening to you in the most humane way possible. How are we equipping them to do that? In fact, in medical school, we tend to have this strange, bifurcated view of listening. We tend to think of, well, Listening is something ineffable. It's something magical. You either are born with it or you don't have it. And hey, if you're a bad listener, then we'll just shuffle you off to the lab or make sure you go into a subspecialty where you don't have to take care of patients too much. So either we think about it that way, or we tend to think of listening as a checklist. We're told things like, you know, the studies show that if you sit at the bedside, those doctors actually get sued less. So when you go into a patient's room, sit down and meet their eye for 10 seconds. And when they stop, then pause for a couple of beats and repeat back the last three things they said to you so that they know you were listening. And now look, I have nothing against sitting at the bedside or repeating what somebody said. But to me, this is not really listening. This is just enacting listening. This is kind of faking it till you make it. And to me, there's just no excuse for faking your humanity when you are tasked with assisting somebody in their most dire moment. There 
is no excuse for faking your humanity at those moments. And so I was delighted when I came out of training. I found colleagues who also felt the same way. Colleagues who are thinking about things like narrative competence, which is essentially the skill set to elicit, interpret, and act upon a patient's story. The idea is that we would never graduate somebody from medical or nursing or therapy school who wasn't competent in their anatomy or their physiology, right? Why would we graduate somebody who wasn't competent in dealing with a patient's story? So over the years, I've actually started to think about this idea of competence and challenge it a little bit. Because while this is good, to me it still has a little bit of that hierarchy, right, that on a pedestal thing. And part of that is because when I was in medical school, I would be given these courses in cultural competency. And I would be given a list of 10 things that Dominican Americans believe, or 10 things that Southeast Asians do. And I'd be told, you know, susto, when somebody says susto, they mean this, right? So memorize this list and then you will be competent in dealing with this community. And not only is that troubling, because it's really reductionist, but as a woman of color trainee, here I was being told how to deal with these other patients when boy, those other patients looked a lot like me, right? And so I was really intrigued when I read some educators who suggested that, well, maybe instead of cultural competence, thinking about the other, we should think about cultural humility, train people to think about themselves, their own prejudices and expectations and orientations towards stories. So I thought, well, okay, cultural humility, but that seems to be something that you only do when those other people come into your office, whatever that means. What if we started thinking about narrative humility? The fact that every human being has some aspect of the unknowable. Every story might have a gorilla waiting around the corner, right? So narrative humility is that sense of humility towards that which we do not know, the face of the other, the face we cannot know, but to which we are responsible. OK, all well and good. Narrative humility. I'm trying to sell it to my medical colleagues and they're not buying it. Why? Because humility isn't sexy, at least in this country the way we understand it now. We tend to think of humility as solely the purview of somebody very, very spiritual, yeah? Or solely the purview of somebody very, very passive, right? The guy who can't kick the football. And if there's anything we like to do in medicine, we like to kick the football, right? We like to live in the active verb. We suture and debreed and incise and diagnose. We don't like to think of ourselves receiving and opening up and witnessing. So what I'm asking for here is nothing less than a real cultural change, than a revolution in the way we think about ourselves and think about humility. That in fact, humility is powerful. Humility can help overthrow the most powerful empire in the world, right? That in fact, humility is a necessary adjunct, is a necessary partner of action. You only have to think of the heart, which must fill up with blood before it can pump out again. The lungs, which must, must inhale before we can exhale. To realize that listening and action are necessary partners in medicine. And so, back to my original question, which was, can listening be taught? Yes, a resounding yes. It's what I do every single day. I teach listening by having my students read stories. Like Nancy Mayers, who's a memoirist, who writes about having MS and using a wheelchair. And she says that when she started publishing, people started coming out of the woodwork. They would send her these emails and letters. Me too, me too. And she says, it's as though the parts we were all singing that we thought were solos turned out to be a chorus. Only none of us was singing loud enough for the others to hear. And so we see here that telling and listening become an antidote to isolation, a call for community. I also teach listening by having my students write their own personal story their own embodied stories of illness. One young woman, a medical student who also had MS, published this beautiful essay, but she published it ultimately under a pseudonym because she felt like there was such a punishment in medical culture for any sign of weakness, right? Any doctor who's ill, you, you can't talk about it. And yet, at the end of her essay, she had the most 
beautiful advice for her colleagues. She said, don't stand by the foot of the bed and tower over your patient. She feels small already. Take a minute, sit down, listen, try to understand. Realize that you'll never understand. Try anyway. Narrative humility, right? Realize you'll never understand. Try anyway. And finally, I teach listening by having my students actually witness stories, do oral histories. One of the most moving oral histories was here at Sarah Lawrence. A student of mine named Marlise Brosnan, she asked me to use her name, came to me and said, Sayantani, I'd like to interview a relative of mine who has late stage ALS and he can't speak anymore. Can I interview him? And I said, well, how are you going to engage in this listening exercise with somebody who can't speak? She said, trust me. And we did. And it was one of the most moving stories I've ever had the opportunity to witness. She showed us this video of her relative, Casey, who was sitting in his wheelchair with you know, his breathing apparatus and all of his accoutrement. And she would ask him a question. And he would start to answer with his left hand, writing it down. And when he grew tired, she would come in and write, you know, finish writing the sentence and say, is that what you meant? And he would nod. And in this way, together, Together, in that relational space, they co-constructed his story. And so she wrote about it. The interaction is central, and what he is writing is secondary. He is having his say, and I am the instrument that is giving voice to his thoughts. Right? What a beautiful model for that relational space in healthcare. So finally, I just want to say that teaching listening has been the most humbling and moving experience for me over the years. Bell Hooks writes that education can be a practice of freedom. Education that connects the will to know with the will to become. And that learning is a place where paradise can be created. And so I'd like to suggest that a healthcare that is practiced from a stance of narrative humility, a place that connects the will to know with the will to become, that creates a situation such that listening is a place where paradise can be created. Thank you very much.